Really special day here because there is unprecedented security in New York this morning for the Pope's historic visit to the city. There are thousands of police officers on duty for Francis's first full day right here in the Big Apple. The Pope received a tremendous welcome in Manhattan yesterday. It really was just an incredible moment. There were tens of thousands of excited New Yorkers that lined uh, Fifth Avenue. It was, you know, it was just a spectacular moment, you know, to, to have the city just waiting for the Pope and then the reception that he received. It was squeals. You could hear yeah. squeals <laughs> there were people Fifth Avenue squealing. as he drove by. Except maybe the cab drivers who were a little grumpy, I think, but everybody else is pretty excited. The New York Post has rebranded itself this morning as the New York Pope. The pontiff's message is being heard across the country, and this morning he'll speak to the world when he addresses the United Nations. Margaret Brennan is there. Margaret, good morning. Good morning. Well, the Vatican flag will be raised here at the U.N. to welcome Pope Francis. When Pope Francis leaves the U.N. this morning, his motorcade will take him to the World Trade Center. He will pay his respects on the hallowed piece of ground. Okay. Chip Reed is in lower Manhattan above the National 9-11 Memorial. Chip, good morning. That's right. He will be here at Ground Zero later this morning. And as you can imagine, it's going to be a very emotional experience for all involved. He will visit the reflecting pools where the trade towers once stood, and he will pray there. He will visit the 9-11 Museum. He will participate in a wreath-laying ceremony. He will meet with families of 9-11 victims and first responders, and he will lead an interfaith service. Security is extremely tight, Nora, as you mentioned. In fact, there are more than 6,000 NYPD officers who are dedicated to keeping Francis safe. Uh, but I tell you, Francis is, one, is uh, an unusual pope. Uh, he always finds some way to break through security and meet people who are not on the official schedule. Nora? That's why we call him the People's Pope. Chip, thank you so much. Francis? The first pope to enter the 9-11 museum. Pope Benedict had been here. It was not built at that time, but he did say a prayer at the site. We are awaiting words from Cardinal Timothy Dolan, but before that, you can see the pope greeting members of the religious faiths one by one. And as he entered the hall as well, greeting many who were there to see him, this is an important moment for Pope Francis and the world. Yes, absolutely. Papa Francesco, on behalf of this very distinguished group, representatives of the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh, Native American, Jewish, Islamic, and Christian communities of New York City, our civic and public officials, and the board of the September 11th Memorial Foundation, I renew to you our welcome and our joy at your visit. Welcome, Holy Father. One of the things we do very well is sincere and fruitful interreligious friendship. Our ancestors came here for religious freedom, and they found in New York City an atmosphere of respect and appreciation for religious diversity about which you just spoke at the United Nations. We, who have the honor of pastoring our people, we work together we pray together, we meet together, we talk to one another, and we try to serve as one. The city we are proud to call our earthly home while awaiting our true and eternal residence in heaven. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam wa ilayka yarja'u salam jalali wal ikram O oh Allah, you are peace and all peace is from you and all peace returns to you.
At this time, I call upon Dr. Rick Warren, pastor of the Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, to provide the invocation. commit our new president and his wife Michelle and his daughters Malia and Sasha into your loving care. I humbly ask this in the name of the one who changed my life, Yeshua, Isa, Jesus, Jesus. Yeshua, Isa, Jesus, Jesus. In respect to homosexuality, Francis famously said, quote, If someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has good will, who am I to judge? Are gay people going to hell? No, not because they're gay. Everybody, we go to hell because we choose to reject the grace of God. The so, only way you can go so to hell gay, is if you reject the grace of If a gay person just, accepts, accepts Christ. Jesus Christ, he's going to heaven. Okay. Without a doubt. Okay. Fair, fair. Yeah. It, authenticity, humility, Pope Francis is the perfect example of this. Hmm. He, is a, he is doing everything right. You see, people will listen to what we say if they like what they see. see. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as our new Pope, he was very, very symbolic in... Yeah. His loving the children, this authenticity, this humility, the caring for the poor. This is what the whole world expects us Christians to do. Hmm. And when, we, when they go, oh, that's what a Christian does. I, in fact, there was a headline here in Orange County, and I love the headline. I saved it. It said, if you love Pope Francis, you'll love Jesus. <laughs> that was a headline? That was a headline. Oh. It was a headline. I saved it. I showed it to a group of priests I was uh, speaking to a while back. We have far more in common than what divides us. When you talk about Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelicals, uh, Fundamentalist, Catholics, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, and on, on, and on, and on. Well, they would all say, we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the Bible, we believe in the resurrection, we believe salvation is through Jesus Christ. These are the big issues. Sometimes Protestants think that Catholics worship Mary like she's another god. But that's not exactly Catholic doctrine. There's the understanding, and, and people say, well, what are the saints all about? Are, you know, you're, why are you praying to the saints? And when you understand what they mean by what they're saying, there's a whole lot more commonality. Now, there's still real differences, no, no doubt about that. But the most important thing is, if you love Jesus, we're on the same team. The unity that I think we would see realistically is not a structural unity, but a unity of mission. And so when it comes to the family, we are co-workers in the field on this for the protection of what we call the sanctity of life, the sanctity of sex, and the sanctity of marriage. So there's a great commonality, and there's no division on any of those three. Many times people have been beaten down for taking a biblical stance and they start to feel, well, maybe I'm, I'm out here all by yourself. No, you're not. The church is growing in Latin America. The church is growing in Asia. The church is growing in Africa. It's not growing in North America or Europe, but it is growing everywhere else. And so we kind of have this feeling that maybe we're not uh, uh, as, 
as influential, but we're far more influential than people realize. If you're wanting more peace and real purpose in your life, then discover seven secrets to happiness in Tom Peterson's new book, Catholics Come Home. Coach Lou Holtz, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, Pastor Rick Warren, and Touched by an Angel's Roma Downey are all praising Catholics Come Home. So here at the Harvest, Greg just preached, Minnie responded, Chuck Smith and Rick Warren here. What are you guys' thoughts? Well, who wants to go to Disneyland after that? <laughs> <laughs> just thrilling to see again the work of God's Holy Spirit transforming people from the power of darkness into the glorious kingdom of light. All right. Thank you, Chuck and Rick. And uh, the people who don't believe that crusade evangelism uh, still works, well, I have two words, Greg Laurie. All right. And it keeps going. Amen. All right. Very cool. Coming to you back from the backstage here at Angel Stadium, getting ready for night number three of the Harvest Crusade. 20th anniversary here with Rick Warren. You have not changed one bit. You're still the same person you were, uh, you know, years ago when I was 19 going to little college in uh, Riverside and you were starting a church out there. I think it was called Harvest or something like that. And uh, this is a man I know that I love. And thank you, by the way, for preaching at Saddle Bass last week. Nice. Now, you were a wimp because you only did four of the six services. But on the other hand, uh, you're a pretty good guy. Now, Rick, I just began, I just began following you on Twitter. And oh, did you? It's yeah. awesome. You, you've been, your Twitter's a great I'm, I'm trying to mentor pastors and church planters through Twitters. Are and, you enjoying it? Oh, I, I love it. Greg Laurie is here. Just signing his book. Did a sermon today on Lost Boy. This is Pastor Greg Laurie. Saddleback Church. It was an awesome message. Great message today at Saddleback Church. For that. All right, back we go to the phones to Orange, California with Ben on the line. Ben, welcome to Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Uh I am a loyal listener. I um, love going to uh, your men's conferences, and uh, I fellowship with quite a few people at Calvary Chapels, uh, um, with Greg Laurie's Harvest. And I have a question because I, sometimes I have a hard time understanding um, how I um, communicate with people um, of the Protestant faith because I'm Catholic. And mm -hmm. sometimes we um, have communication issues, and they want to get into apologetics. And, uh, um, you know, I love the worship and the fellowship with those with different people, but um, I'm going to hang on to my faith as well. And I'm just curious uh, what you think about Okay, good question there, Ben. In fact, we're glad you're going to these events. We're glad you listened to this program. Okay, Chuck, what about that? Ben, I have a cousin who was a mother superior in the Catholic Church, and uh, she was just a wonderful Christian, loved her, and we had great conversations together. And I didn't try to convert her from Catholicism, nor did she try to convert me uh, into becoming a Catholic. It's just we both recognize that, uh, you know, we have we have the same Lord and the same uh, faith, you know. And so uh, we just, uh, you know, on those things that we agreed upon, we just agreed upon. And we didn't really bring up the things where there were disagreements. All right, we're going to go to Ontario, California, and talk to Beverly. Beverly, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Welcome. You have about a minute left, so if you can state your question. Yes, I have a question. Is it right for a Catholic woman to marry a Christian man even though she's pregnant with his child? All right, Pastor Chuck. Well, I don't uh, see that. Uh, well, there's going to be difficulty, uh, you know, is it, you know, uh, but if you can resolve the differences, I don't think that they're that great, and I think that you probably, uh, if you're pregnant with his child, you should marry him. And, uh, and of course, I think that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all right. It can, uh, 
uh, you can resolve the differences. I, and I think that uh, it's, it's it, I know I know of many uh, of that. You know, you know, Catholics are basically Christians too, and uh, so uh, I think that uh, you know what the differences are are much less than uh, what a lot of people face and are overcoming in their marriages. I think the more important questions are, is he a good man, and do they love each other? Mm -hmm. So fasten your seatbelts. All right, Brian, I like this next one. Nora from Huntington Beach, California. Nora, thank you for calling. You are on Pastor's Perspective on Terrific Thursday. Yes, hi, how are you? We are wonderful, thank you. Good. Um, My call is about uh, Catholicism and Christianity. Um, I was baptized uh, Catholic uh, as a little girl, and now I am more, uh, you know, I believe in the Christian faith, and at this point I've kind of got a conflict within my family because they would like my kids to be baptized Catholic, but, you know, uh, I just kind of want to know what the difference between the two is. Sure. I think we need to rephrase the question a little bit, don't we, though, Brian, about Catholicism and Protestantism, maybe, yeah, yeah. in that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because Catholicism is Christianity. Yep. It's just uh, a, a form of Christianity that uh, we would see as not you know, completely consistent with the, with the scriptural picture in some areas. And so f- just to kind of you know, talk about it broadly, mm-hmm. um, the, the Bible emphasizes a personal relationship with Jesus that mm-hmm. comes through personal faith in him, being born again. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, emphasizes more that you're part of the church. That the, the, in a sense, it's, the Bible says Jesus is the mediator between God and men. In Catholicism, the church is sort of the mediator between God and men. You have the, the priest who mediate. You have the mass that is part of the mediation. And now Don said I would like the question because I grew up in Catholicism, so I know from first-hand experience. Just got one more question coming through. Boring file clerk says, what's your view of the current pope? You know, the pope has obviously been reaching out and has been a force of moderation in comparison to his predecessors. What do you make of it? I think the pope is fantastic. You know, I just think his tone, his humility, his, you know, I loved when he said the other day, you know, and it's it's, it's our view too. We're not trying to you know, make this a little bitty narrow thing. Anybody's welcome. We, we may not agree, you know, 100% on doctrine and theology, but you know what, we're will, the, the church, the Catholic church, our church, it's open for everybody. So I like his tone, not pushing people away, but I believe- There's a, uh, you, you say here, also in that spirit of inclusiveness, it doesn't matter who likes you or who doesn't like you. I like that. All that matters is God likes you. He accepts you, he approves of you. Is that true for, every, is that true for homosexuals? Absolutely. I believe that God's breathed his life into every single person. We're all on a journey. And so I'm not here, you know, preaching hate, pushing people down, telling, I'm not here to tell everybody what they're doing wrong. More than 60,000 people will pack Yankee Stadium tomorrow for a night of hope. It's a huge event featuring Lakewood Church Pastor Joel Osteen and his wife Victoria. Before he arrived in New York, Osteen paid a special visit to the Vatican, where he met with Pope Francis. Tonight, Osteen shares the experience with Local 2 anchor Dominique Soxa in a story you'll see only on 2 tonight. I'm here at Yankee Stadium in New York, where Pastors Joel and Victoria Osteen are getting ready for Lakewood Church's Night of Hope coming up tomorrow night. As we sat down and talked about the preparations for the big event, Joel revealed to me an incredible opportunity he just had to meet with Pope Francis. I just felt very honored and very humbled. You know, seeing the Pope give the Mass to 100,000 people that day, you just see, you know, he's had such a heart to help people. I love the fact that he's made the church more inclusive, not trying to make it smaller, but to try to make it larger, to take everybody in. So that just resonates with me. You know, he really expressed his desire for us to pray for him. He asked us to pray for the Middle East. It seems like the Vatican was trying to send a message yes. by doing this. What would you say that is? I think the message is is that they respect people, all people, and that they want to see unity. Was it surreal to be asked by the Pope to pray for him? Yeah, it was. It was amazing, um, you know. And even to go back in that part of the Vatican, mm-hmm. just so much history there, the places that we they took us through, and just to, you feel that deep respect and reverence for God. There's thinking today among Christians that we can work with all religions, solving problems like disease, AIDS, poverty, and so on. This is an ecumenical idea, meaning that um, 
that all religions have a part to play in solving the problems that we see around the world. What gods are these religions submitted to? Is this the biblical God? Well, no. If, if you're working with Muslims, it's Allah. Allah has no son. Allah is not the God of the Bible. If it's Hinduism, then we're talking about Brahman, a force out there. There are many religions that are trying to serve their gods and through good works. Can a Christian be involved in the good works with other religions to the glory of God? What God? Romanism's religio-political ideal dovetails with present-day goals of the emergent church movement, the purpose-driven movement, the new apostolic reformation, reformed theology, and other evangelical Protestant denominations that believe they must comply with today's cultural mandate to bring about God's kingdom on earth for Jesus Christ to return to. Rick Warren, in his Global Peace Plan, wants to work with all the religions of the world in order to solve the world's problems can't be done without compromising the faith. Problem is, all those religions believe that they will have salvation, attain nirvana or paradise or heaven, whatever it might be, through their works. That is contrary to biblical Christianity. It's contrary to, I would think, what Rick Warren believes. You're not saved by your works. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ, who paid the full penalty for your sins. How can you communicate that to a Hindu, to a Buddhist, who wants to practice their own religion and reach their own godhood or reach their own uh, view of heaven through their good works? doesn't compute. The person over here who asked about uh, the millennial goals, I, I met last month with uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, to talk about faith based organizations working with the UN on this and later you should talk to Tony Blair who's just formed a foundation he's much too humble to talk about it on this very issue to my brother Islamic brother here from Italy I would say I'm not really interested in interfaith dialogue I'm interested in interfaith projects we got enough talk <laughs> so uh, two weeks ago or uh, a, few, a few weeks ago at Georgetown University we brought in three imams we brought in three Catholic priests we brought in three evangelical pastors and we brought in three rabbis and we said, what can we do about AIDS? We see with the various movements in the church reaching out and unifying people without the gospel. We also see Rick Warren in his peace plan that's based on good works, combining political strategies with the church, causing the church to actually be enlisted for bringing about this one global community, thinking we can minimize the gospel, we can just dialogue and understand other belief systems and appreciate them. This is dialectic at its finest. Dialectic is the idea of taking two opposites, talking about them, and creating a synthesis. Dialectic is designed to move people off of their absolute belief systems and come together in a blended, cooperative effort that gets along and ignores the absolute extremes. We see those who claim to be evangelicals embracing the other world religions, but without the gospel being the mainstay. Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, when he spoke at the Islamic Society Convention of North America, didn't mention the gospel. It's a tragic thing that he would make that kind of an appearance and yet never ever give the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because as you look at the broader spectrum of Christians all around the world and denominations and so forth, what most of the time people don't realize is that all of us essentially believe the same thing. We just have minor differences but the sad thing is, it's usually over the minor differences that we divide and become contentious with one another. So I believe that the Lord is, is wanting unity in his church. He's speaking about loving one another across denominational lines and about working together as members of the universal body of Christ for the advancement of the kingdom of Christ. So that's my conviction, and that's what I have shared with people on occasion. And I have uh, sometimes spoken about this publicly. Uh, sometimes I've written on the subject. Now, not everyone is happy with me about this. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, this really irritates some people. And uh, I have been accused by some of selling out. I don't know what I've sold out to, but I've been accused of selling out. I've been accused of compromising. Uh, some people have uh, accused me of being emergent. And I know most of you don't even know what that means. And the people that accuse me of that obviously don't know what it means either because they never would accuse me of being emergent if they knew what it really meant because I am the farthest thing from emergent. Some have pejoratively labeled me as an ecumenical evangelical. An ecumenical evangelical. Now, I have to say, that is a title that I gladly accept. All of us should be ecumenical evangelicals. What do those words mean? Well, ecumenical, according to Webster's Dictionary, it refers to being involved as Christians with different groups of Christians or different kinds of Christian churches. It refers to uh, Christians who seek to relate to the whole body of Christ. I think we are supposed to be ecumenical. 